Okay, well, welcome back. We are now going to cover part two of metabolism. And in this lecture, we're going to cover the very specific pathways that are part of what we call primary metabolism. Primary metabolism includes glycolysis, uh, a transition step, Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle. And finally, the end of this process known as the electron transport chain. We will also cover other forms of aerobic metabolism as well as anaerobic metabolism. And we will very briefly in a slide or two talk about photosynthesis. We will also cover two pathways that are bacteria specific, not found in eukaryotic uh, metabolism. And finally, we will finish things off with the metabolic highway, which I see a typo in the slide. I will fix that. All right, so let's move on. All right, primary metabolism is the breakdown of glucose. And glucose is the one sugar that most living things are capable of breaking down. We share primary metabolic enzymes with most other living organisms. So primary metabolism is kind of like the big highway and everything else feeds into primary metabolism and usually comes out of or is initiated from primary metabolism. And primary metabolism is the me metabolism of glucose. And glucose is initially broken down. It's accepted into the body or into the cell in glycolysis. Now glycolysis is a 10 step metabolic pathway. It is a branched pathway. Steps one through five, the first five enzymes involved in this pathway, this is known as the investment phase. And in the investment phase, we actually have to put in two ATP. So it's gonna cost us two ATP to start this entire process. But remember, at the end of glucose metabolism, excuse me, at the end of glucose metabolism, we end up with approximately anywhere from 32 to 36 ATP. And the first two that we have to pay, that we have to put in in the beginning are the only ones that we have to add. So we really are kind of ahead of the game. If our initial investment is only two ATP and at the end of breaking down a single glucose molecule, I get 36, I'm looking at 18 times the return on my investment. That's not a bad return. I'll take those odds all day long. So initially in the investment phase, we have to actually contribute to ATP to the process. In steps six through 10, the second half of glycolysis, not only do we get back the two ATP that we paid, but we actually make two more. So think of it in terms of net pay versus gross pay. Gross pay is how much money you take home in your paycheck before taxes. And net pay is how much you take home after taxes. So the gross pay or the gross payoff in glycolysis is going to be four ATP. But since we had to invest two to begin with, we have to kind of we have to kind of reduce those. So our net pay, our actual profit is two ATP. But in addition to 2 ATP, because if you think about it in terms of cellular function, 2 ATP is not a lot of ATP. There's not a whole lot there. So glycolysis is not going to is not going to sustain the cell for a long period of time because it can't produce enough ATP. However, in addition to the 2 ATP that, are, that we net profit in this process, we also produce 2 NADH. And if you remember from lecture one, NADH is an electron carrier. It's one of those energy intermediates. So NAD plus is hanging out around glycolysis, picks up some electrons, and takes those electrons to the electron transport chain. In the electron transport chain, a single electron from NADH can make somewhere around three or four ATP. So we get more for our more bang for our buck if we use electron carriers than if we're just directly producing ATP. Now ATP production in glycolysis is carried out by substrate level phosphorylation. That's how ATP is made. Um, and at the very end of glycolysis, the final product of this pathway is pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And we make two of those. So we're gonna go to the next slide here. And let's take a look at this pathway. Now at the very top of this diagram, we have our glucose molecule entering into glycolysis and we have all of the steps outlined. In the very first step, when glucose enters into glycolysis, it's going to be phosphorylated. A phosphate group is gonna be added to one end of it. It becomes glucose 6-phosphate. A little bit later on uh, in step three, 
A second ATP is going to be added, which is not showing in this diagram here, but you can see the arrow coming in. That second ATP gives us a fructose 1,6-diphosphate, meaning there's two phosphate groups added. And that's where the two ATP are coming from that we're having to add to this pathway. Once we hit step five, in step five, our what was a linear pathway becomes a branched pathway because the, the glucose molecule, which is a six carbon sugar, gets cut in half. And so we have now two three carbon molecules. Each of these are going to give us one NADH and each one's going to give us two ATP for a total at the end of our pathway of two NADH net profit, two ATP net profit, and two pyruvate molecules net profit. In addition to uh, uh, glycolysis, bacteria can use a pathway known as the pentose phosphate pathway. In the pentose phosphate pathway, this is bacteria specific, eukaryotic cells do not use this pathway. And in pentose phosphate pathway, bacteria are taking five carbon sugars and converting them into six carbon sugars. So they can then enter into glycolysis. The final product of this, however, is not pyruvate. Instead, it is what's known as G3P, which is glycerol 3 phosphatase. So our glyceraldehyde 3P. So we have this G3P final product. G3P is a three carbon molecule that can be put together to create a six carbon molecules, which glucose happens to be a six carbon molecule. So in the pentose phosphate pathway, five carbon sugars get broken down and rearranged and changed into these little G3P molecules, which can be used to build all kinds of different biological molecules and enter into different anabolic pathways. There are two intermediates in the pathway that are considered precursor metabolites that will be used for anabolism. And they'll be, uh, they will actually leave the pentose phosphate pathway halfway through and go enter into um, amino acid uh, synthesis pathways. By the way, the pentose phosphate pathway, this pathway, because we're converting five carbon sugars into three carbon molecules to make six carbon sugars, I know that's a little confusing, so you might want to rewind and Re and uh, listen to that again. We're converting five carbon sugars into three carbon molecules that can become six carbon sugars. Uh, during this process, the pentose phosphate pathway runs at the same time as glycolysis. And it also, in this process, will make one ATP. So we do get a single ATP molecule from the pentose phosphate pathway. Now back to primary metabolism. At the end of glycolysis, remember we have those two pyruvate molecules. So these guys are just floating around in here. We have to do something with them. So they will enter into what's called the transition step. The transition step is where the pyruvic acid or the pyruvate from the end of glycolysis is ready to enter into the Krebs cycle. However, the Krebs cycle can't accept pyruvate. So we have to convert pyruvate into another molecule. And the conversion of pyruvate is going to require a very special enzyme known as enzyme CoA. Enzyme CoA is decarboxylated, which means a CO2 molecule will be removed. So remember when, when you inhale and then exhale, when you inhale, you take in oxygen. When you exhale, you get rid of CO2. The CO2 that you are exhaling is actually coming from your metabolism from this transition step and Krebs cycle. It's a waste product of metabolism. It's not something that you're inhaling. It's part of the apple that you had for breakfast. So when pyruvate enters into this transition step, we're gonna convert pyruvate into um, a compound known as acetyl-CoA. During the transition step, we produced CO2 molecules and we produce an NADH. No ATP is produced during the transition step. So acetyl-CoA formation only gives off CO2 waste. And because we are removing a carbon off that pyruvate, remember pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. The transition step is going to convert it into a two carbon molecule. So we're gonna lose a carbon. When we release that carbon, we make CO2 as well as we free an electron. When we free an electron, NAD plus is going to pick it up, becomes NADH, 
and our final molecule is called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is what will be accepted into the Krebs cycle. Now the Krebs cycle, your textbook calls it the TCA cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle. We, I call it the Krebs cycle. That's just how I learned it. It's kind of old school. It's named after uh, Krebs, who actually discovered and outlined this process. So uh, the uh, citric acid cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle, and Krebs cycle are all the same thing. They're the exact same process, just four different names for it. All right, so now that we know what we're talking about. The Krebs cycle is where we finally finish off glucose. Now see, primary metabolism, glycolysis, transition step, and the Krebs cycle, the whole purpose of all three of these different pathways, these metabolic pathways in primary metabolism is not ATP production. It's oxidation of glucose. We're basically taking a glucose molecule and we're stripping every last little electron off of that molecule that we possibly can. Because the substrate level phosphorylation is not a very efficient way to make ATP. The electron transport chain, on the other hand, is an excellent way to make ATP. But it, mean, it means that we need electrons. So we're just using glucose for its electrons, not for its carbons or anything like that. We want to strip as many electrons off of glucose as we possibly can. Glycolysis starts that process. Uh, Acetyl-CoA formation rips off a carbon and we get an electron from that. And then we move that process into the Krebs cycle to finish off and get the last of the electrons from glucose. So the primary function of the TCA cycle is production of energy intermediates, which would be NADH and FADH2. It would be the production of precursor metabolites. So molecules that are intermediates in this pathway can sometimes leave the pathway to go and enter into anabolic uh, processes. And we do get some ATP from the Krebs cycle, but really it's fin the final oxidation of glucose. Um, ATP production in the Krebs cycle, we get two ATP per glucose molecule. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Now, since glycolysis results um, in two pyruvates, each time a pyruvate enters into the Krebs cycle, that's considered a single turn. So for each glucose molecule, that's the TCA or the Krebs cycle will turn twice. So here we have just a basic diagram of the cycle on the left is where we have conversion of pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. That's that transition step. And once we have acetyl-CoA, this molecule enters into the Krebs cycle. It is initially converted into citric acid, which is why they call it the citric acid cycle. And each time it, it moves through, we're looking at one turn here, each time a uh, acetyl-CoA goes through the Krebs cycle, we get three NADH, so we get three energy intermediates in the form of NADH. We get one energy intermediate in the form of FADH2. We get two carbon dioxide molecules. Those are waste. And we get a single ATP. So one turn of the Krebs cycle gives me three NADH, one FADH2, one ATP. If this is per glucose molecule, that cycle is going to turn twice. So if it turns twice for every glucose molecule, I get six NADH, two FADH2, and two ATP. Okay. So make sure if you're reading a question, how many turns of the Krebs cycle? Am I asking per turn of a Krebs cycle? Am I asking per pyruvate or per acetyl-CoA? Or am I asking per glucose molecule? Because if it's per glucose molecule, you have to count that cycle as turning twice. Just a heads up. Now, once our um, once our our acetyl our pyruvate our glucose has been converted into pyruvate, pyruvate's been converted into acetyl CoA, and acetyl CoA enters into the Krebs cycle. All of that oxidizes glucose and removes lots and lots of electrons from glucose. And all of these electrons will be carried by either NADH or FADH2, and they're going to enter into the electron transport chain. And this is where we start using cellular respiration. 
Now cellular respiration is the use of oxygen at the end of an electron transport chain to attract and pull electrons through the electron transport chain in order to create a force known as the proton motor force, which will in turn drive production of ATP. The electron transport chain provides the highest yield of ATP of any of the metabolic processes. NADH and FADH2 are responsible. Their primary function is to provide electrons to the electron transport chain. Uh, the electron transport chain itself is a series of enzymes known as cytochromes, and these cytochromes are going to move electrons in a specific order and harness energy from them. The energy they harness is used to create a proton gradient. The proton gradient, in turn, creates what's known as the proton motive force. Okay. So I'm going to show you a diagram on the next slide that compares the electron transport chain in E. coli in a bacterial cell to the electron transport chain in a eukaryote. So here we have the electron transport chain uh, in E. coli up top and the electron transport chain in a eukaryotic cell at the bottom. Now I want you to look at the bottom diagram first. Uh, because it's, that's, this is how the electron transport chain works in our own cells. So it's the one you would be most familiar with. Now NADH has the ability to enter the electron transport chain. When it goes to the electron transport chain, it's going to hook up with the very first cytochrome or enzyme in that uh, chain. And that is known as complex 1. Complex 1 is where NADH is going to drop off its electron. And complex 1, as an enzyme, is going to harness that electron, absorb energy from it, and transfer it to a small compound, that little purple one, called ubiquinone. Ubiquinone simply just moves that electron from complex 1 to complex 2. That's all it does. Now complex 2 is also going to absorb the electron and utilize some of the energy being given off by that electron to pump protons, just like complex one did. As the electron moves through complex two, it will meet with another compound known as cytochrome C, which transfers it to complex four. Complex four will harness the last of the energy from that electron and directly transfer the electron to oxygen. Now oxygen is known as the terminal electron acceptor or final electron acceptor. This right here, oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain, this is why we must breathe oxygen. This is why we have to have oxygen. We cannot survive without oxygen because oxygen is what pulls electrons through the electron transport chain. See, electrons don't just move on their own, they have to be pulled. And oxygen has the highest electronegativity. Electronegativity is attraction to electrons. So I always think of oxygen as if you're a girl, oxygen is a really cute guy. And you walk into a bar one day and you walk up to the bar and the bartender says to you, hey, you order a drink and the bartender says, hey, the guy down at the end of the bar over on your right there, that guy bought you a drink. And so you look up to see who this is that bought you a drink and you look over and there's some incredibly gorgeous hunky guy at the end of the bar waving to you, right? We're talking Shamar Moore, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, something like that. And you looked over at the end of the bar and before you even know it, you are walking towards the end of the bar to go meet this guy, this hunky guy that, that bought you a drink. That's electronegativity, magnetism, pull. You're the electron their oxygen. Okay. In anaerobic cellular respiration, the same process is occurring, but instead of oxygen being at the end of the bar, something else is there. So at the end of the electron transport chain, instead of that really strong electromagnetic pull of oxygen, you have the electromagnetic pull of sulfur or carbon or some or nitrogen. And it has an electronegativity, it's pulling, but it doesn't have as strong of a pull as oxygen. Oxygen has the greatest electronegativity. So that energy that oxygen is giving off that pulls those electrons 
gets those electrons really excited and those electrons get very excited and this causes them to give off more energy than if it were another compound at the end of the electron transport chain. That's the difference between aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic cellular respiration. In aerobic, oxygen is at the end of the electron transport chain and literally pulls electrons through the electron transport chain, causing them to give off the most energy. Now, why do we want these electrons to give off energy? Well, take a look at that diagram at the bottom at complex one, complex three, and complex four. Complex one, three, and four, you'll see there's a large black arrow that's pointing upwards. And what that arrow is indicating is the movement of protons across the membrane. Now remember, this electron transport chain is occurring in the mitochondria, and these cytochrome complexes are located in the inner matrix or inner membrane of the mitochondria. In order for an electron transport chain to work, it must be embedded in a membrane. And those electrons are providing energy for those cytochrome complexes to pump electrons from one side of the membrane to the other. And what they're doing is they're creating a concentration gradient of protons. So we have a really high concentration of protons at the top of that membrane on one side and a much lower concentration on the other. This creates a concentration gradient. That concentration gradient is what's known as the proton motive force. The proton motive force is what the cell is going to use to make ATP. So once we create this proton gradient, we have these proton pumps that have pumped all these protons to one side of the membrane. Well, they're just going to keep building up because protons are charged particles and they, have, they do not have the ability to diffuse across the membrane freely. Charged particles cannot diffuse freely across a uh, phospholipid bilayer. So we have an enzyme all the way at the very end called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is where protons have a tunnel. They can actually diffuse through the middle of that ATP synthase enzyme to the other side of the membrane. And as they diffuse through, remember protons are charged particles. So as they diffuse through the membrane, they give off energy that ATP synthase will harness to make ATP. So the proton motive force is where protons diffusing through ATP synthase provide energy for ATP synthase to make ATP, to synthesize ATP from free phosphate groups and ADP. So let's go back and just recap this real quick. Glycolysis rearranges glucose molecules so we can access some electrons and provides us with pyruvate to continue the process. Transition step converts pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and in the process provides us with some energy intermediates. Acetyl-CoA enters into the Krebs cycle to complete the oxidation of glucose and provide us with more energy intermediates. Now all of these energy intermediates, the NADH and the FADH2, now enter into the electron transport chain. NADH will drop off its electrons at complex one. FADH2 will drop off its, uh, its electrons at complex two. Either way, these electrons will be attracted to oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain. But the only way these electrons can make their way to oxygen is through the cytochrome complexes of the electron transport chain. As these electrons move through the electron transport chain, they provide energy to the proton pumps. The proton pumps pump protons from one side of the membrane to the other. When they get to the other side of the membrane, this creates a proton gradient known as the proton motive force. The proton motive force uh, interacts with ATP synthase, which allows the diffusion of protons back across the membrane, and the diffusion of those protons provide the energy for ATP production. Now, theoretically, theoretically, uh, NADH, 
provides enough energy in a single electron because of the three proton pumps that it powers, it can uh, produce about two and a half to three ATP per NADH. And FADH2, we don't make as much of that, but FADH2 drops its electron off at complex two, not at complex one. So it only powers uh, two proton pumps. If you look at the diagram, complex two is that uh, kind of blue enzyme. It will. It is not a proton pump. So complex one is only powered by NADH. Complexes two and four are powered by NADH and FADH2. So NADH gives us about two and a half ATP per per um, electron, and uh, FADH2 gives us about one and a half. So we have, we get more energy from NADH than we do from FADH2. Now before we move on to the next slide, I want you to take a look at the top there because this is micro and we are studying bacteria. And bacterial cells are much smaller and have a much lower ATP need than our own cells most of the time. Now one part of bacteria that does require a very high amount of energy are flagella. And instead of going through all of this process just to make ATP, bacteria oftentimes support flagellar movement using the proton motive force instead of directly from ATP. So the electron transport chain is very similar. If you look at the top diagram, you can see NADH dropping off its electrons. It's using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. It's powering proton pumps. However, one thing to remember, we only have complex one and a complex two, the uh, what's called ubiquinol oxidase. ATP synthase is making ATP for cellular processes, but some of those protons, some of that proton motive force is also uh, being utilized by the basal body of, um, of flagella. So flagella will actually use proton motive force instead of ATP directly in order to power the flagella because the flagella needs so much energy. And so this would be a nice constant form of energy without having to utilize all of the cellular, the cells resources of ATP. So the electron transport chain works exactly the same way. Their bacterial cells are using glycolysis and Krebs cycle and all of that to get electrons off of oxygen, but ultimately they don't only make ATP with their electron transport chain. They will use the electron transport chain to make ATP and drive their um, motility processes, their flagella, using the proton motive force. So ATP yield. Theoretically, again, 32 to 36 ATP per glucose molecule. That's going to be the same uh, for eukaryotic cells as for most prokaryotic cells. They might make a little less if they're utilizing some of their protons for other processes like active transport and uh, uh, flagella. But uh, the production of NADH and FADH2, uh, all of that is really primarily due to energy intermediates. That's the primary function. The primary function of glycolysis and Krebs cycle and TCA or, or um, uh, um, transition step, that is oxidation of glucose and production of energy intermediates. Now let's talk a little bit about anaerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, oxygen is not involved. Now, if we have an organism that is in, that utilizes aerobic cellular respiration as its primary form of energy production and oxygen becomes absent, then this organism is going to have to switch to fermentation. If the organism is in anaerobic cellular respiration, then it will just, that will be the only thing it carries out, will be anaerobic cellular respiration. It will not switch to fermentation. Now, let's talk about uh, fermentation here. Glycolysis is a process that if you didn't notice before, you should notice now, oxygen is not required. In order to run the electron transport chain, if you're aerobic cellular respiration, then that requires oxygen. Your electron transport chain is not going to run without oxygen. Um, but if oxygen is not present, then your electron transport chain is not going to work. No electron transport chain, no ATP production, unless you can use glycolysis. Glycolysis does not require oxygen, and glycolysis gives us two ATP per molecule. So let's see, take a look at how that works. In fermentation, we have two basic types, lactic acid fermentation and mixed acid fermentation. 
Now remember, we're talking about um, bacteria here. A third type of fermentation is ethanol fermentation, or also referred to as alcohol. Uh, there's another pathway that's anaerobic for some bacteria. It's called the 2,3-butane diol pathway. Uh, we are not going to be studying that one. It's a very complex pathway. We'll look at some products of that in lab, but we're not going to go into that in lecture. But it is a, a fermentation process. Now, it's kind of hidden here a little bit in the slide, but one thing to always remember, in order for fermentation to occur, glycolysis must happen. Glycolysis is required for fermentation. Okay? Fermentation is, uh, only occurs on pyruvate, not on glucose. Okay? Now, we know that uh, fermentation is very important. We see lactic acid fermentation in our muscle cells. It's used to make cheese and bread, uh, and then, of course, alcohol fermentation. Now in acid fermentation, it's, an, it's a very important uh, form of identification. We look to see if bacteria are capable of fermenting different types of sugars. Uh, this is just a quick diagram. Remember, pyruvate is what gets fermented, not actual glucose itself. So these are some of the different acids that can be produced by some of the different microorganisms out there, such as clostridium in your left can make acetoacetic acid and butyric acid. Uh, Enterobacter can make carries out the 2,3-butane diol pathway. Uh, e. coli and Shigella, Streptococcus, they make lactic acid, acetic acid, which is vinegar. Uh, Propionobacterium, this is a bacteria that causes acne. They actually uh, create what's called, their waste product is propionic acid. So we have lots of different types of acids that can be produced. Some bacteria are what are called mixed acid fermenters in that they actually will ferment multiple sugars at the same time, converting them into multiple forms of acid. So they produce different kinds of acids all at the same time. So why is glucose so important for fermentation? Well, glycolysis provides NADH. And NADH is what's needed for fermentation. Here we go, back to these energy intermediates again. Now, glycolysis provides two things in this fermentation process. One, glycolysis provides NADH, and NADH is necessary for glycolysis to occur. Two, ATP production is occurring during glycolysis, not during fermentation. Think of fermentation as an extra step. At the end of glycolysis, we have, a, we have pyruvate. Glycolysis occurs exactly the same way, regardless of whether or not oxygen is absent or present. Glycolysis will always occur the same way, and we end up with two pyruvates. At the end of glycolysis, those two pyruvates are what get fermented, not the glucose molecule itself. Now, down in the bottom left of this slide, we have a uh, fermentation of glucose into alcohol, right? So we have alcohol fermentation. In alcohol fermentation, at the bottom you can see in red writing glucose with all the arrows, that's glycolysis. And during glycolysis, two ATP are made and two NADH are made. The two pyruvate from glycolysis will then be converted, a CO2 is removed, and will be converted into acetaldehyde, which will oxidize uh, NADH. When NADH gets oxidized into NAD+, it can then go back to gly glycolysis and be reduced again. The final product of the oxidation of acetaldehyde is ethanol. Now, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to our slide. Um, well, let's take a look at lactic acid fermentation first, and then I'll go back. Now, if you look at lactic acid fermentation in the top right here, we have the same thing going on. Glycolysis into converting glucose into pyruvate. NAD plus is going to be reduced into NADH. Pyruvate gets fermented into lactic acid. And lactic acid is going to be um, oxidized from NADH into NAD plus. Now, why is NAD plus and NADH so important here? Well, because in order for ATP production in glycolysis to occur, reduction of NAD plus must occur. So this is where I'm going to go back to the slide on glycolysis. I just want to go back to it. And I want you to take a look at something in the big pink box there, where the big pink box is in this diagram. Notice that 
that NADH is made before ATP production, right? The ATP up at the top is ATP we're putting in. So we're already using up some ATP there. But at the bottom in that pink box, we, before the cell can make any ATP in glycolysis, it must first break off a carbon, it must break it in half and release an electron. And that electron will reduce NAD plus. That NAD plus becomes NADH. In fermentation, NADH is going to be converted back into NAD+. The reason this is important is because we have to recycle that NAD+. If we just carried out glycolysis and never used fermentation, the cell will eventually run out of NAD+. And if it has no more NAD+, it cannot reduce the NAD+. There's nothing there to reduce. And at step five of glycolysis, would stop. If it stops, if glycolysis ends at step five, we have no ATP production. So what fermentation is really doing is fermentation is recycling our energy intermediates so that glycolysis can continue to make ATP. ATP does not get made during fermentation. ATP gets made during glycolysis. Pyruvate is what gets fermented. All right, so I'm going to move back to where we were and move on. So is glucose the only molecule that gets fermented or the only molecule that gets metabolized? Well, no. We break down lipids. We break down proteins. We break down other sugars. There are all con We can even break down nucleic acids for energy if needed. So bacteria can utilize a whole host of different biological molecules. But in order to do so, glycolysis or glucose uh, metabolism is the most efficient, which is why most cells will try to convert or revert to uh, to glucose metabolism in some way, shape, or form. Now, what I want you to notice on the diagram to the left if, is uh, take a look on the, on the right of that diagram where lipids and proteins are bring, being broken down. When lipids get broken down, the glycerol molecule from a, a lipid molecule enters into glycolysis in stage five or six. The fatty acid chains from lipids get broken down into little uh, two or three carbon units, and they enter and the acetyl-CoA step. Proteins get broken down. Their amino acids get converted into sugar or intermediates that enter into glycolysis in steps six and seven and eight. Other amino acids, depending on, on their structure, will enter into the Krebs cycle. Sugars will, uh, that, are non, uh, that are not glucose, uh, maltose or mannitol or fructose, other sugars will enter into glycolysis as intermediates after being rearranged in their own pathways. So ultimately, what I want you to get from this diagram is that the catabolism of other organic compounds feeds the products from those catabolic pathways feed into primary metabolism, which is glucose metabolic pathways. Now, what about photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is just simply using light energy to uh, excite electrons instead of oxygen. So take a look down at the bottom. Now, photosynthesis occurs in two steps. We have what's called the light reaction and the dark reaction. Um, the light reaction is where light will strike uh, cytochrome light -like complexes in the chloroplasts of plants. And when light strikes these cytochrome complexes, these cytochrome complexes have stripped electrons off of water. So water is split. The hydrogen atoms on um, oxygen that are attached to oxygen get ripped off. The oxygen is then released by the plants. This is why uh, plants give off oxygen. It's coming from water. The hydrogen atoms are split in half to give us the electrons and the protons that are necessary for an electron transport chain. That electron transport chain ultimately is used to create a proton motive force and create ATP. And in this case, the final electron acceptor is um, in, in the light reaction, the, the electron transport chain of uh, the chloroplast is called uh, NADP reductase. So NADP plus becomes NADPH.
The products of this light reaction, both NADPH and ATP, are then used in the second step of photosynthesis known as the Calvin cycle or the dark reaction. In the dark reaction, we take those energy products from the light cycle and we use them to um, jam together CO2 molecules. So when plants absorb CO2 from the environment, they start jamming these CO2 molecules together to create G3P. G3P we saw was also used in that pentose phosphate pathway. So G3P molecules will then be used by plant cells or these photosynthetic cells will then use these G3P molecules to create a whole host of other biological molecules that may be necessary for cellular function. So in addition to catabolism, always remember that the whole point of all of this is also anabolism. In anabolism, we are synthesizing biological molecules as opposed to breaking them down. So catabolic reactions break molecules down, releasing energy. Anabolic reactions build molecules and put them together to create new biological molecules. Uh, so this is known as biosynthesis. And you can see we have, of course, in uh, purple there, the light purple box, we have glycolysis, and below that is the TCA cycle. And you can see following those arrows that sometimes intermediates in these processes will actually leave. They will leave the process in the middle of a, a metabolic pathway to go become something else, to go become an amino acid or an, a nucleic acid or a lipid or a glycerol molecule. So not every glucose molecule that enters into glycolysis is going to be broken down entirely and entered into the electron transport chain. Sometimes the intermediate from it may be released by the pathway to go become something else. It's going to depend on what the cell needs. So overall, I look at metabolism as a really big highway system. Think about it. We can get on I-95 at, at 136th Street and take I-95 all the way to Palm Beach. Or we can get off the highway somewhere in Broward County. We can get off at 595, go to the beach for a few hours, and then get back on at Broward Boulevard. If you're a glucose molecule in your car and you're driving up and down I-95, you have exits and entrances, and you can leave at certain points and get back on at certain points. Uh, when I get back next week, we are going to kind of uh, create a metabolic highway in class together. We're going to take a few minutes at the beginning of class to kind of review some of these concepts. Make sure that you bring your questions with you if there's something that you don't understand. Um, I will try my best to explain that to you. And we'll spend just a few minutes creating a metabolic highway together as a class so we can see how these different molecules move around on these highways. I hope this lecture was informative. If you have any questions, please be sure to either email me or bring them to class on uh, Monday or Tuesday, and we will, I will answer the questions as best as I can. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you all real soon.